RCR with Paul Brennan, Reality Check Radio. Okay, it's our first Friday political panel following the general election. So um, that's something. And joining the panel today is Cameron Slater and Marty Gibson. Olivia, not feeling too good today. I don't know if that's related to the aftermath of this election or there's something going around. <laughs> Who knows? Or a bit of both. Anyway, welcome, chaps. Thanks for coming in this morning. Good morning. Good morning, Paul. How are you doing? Well, I don't know. Are we Are we happy? Are we I'm a bit flat. Dad, are we fair. flat? How are we yeah. feeling? I'm a bit flat because... You know, I sat there and watched uh, the the you know, and we of course we ran our own coverage, and I think I think we did a fantastic job at at RCR in delivering what people needed to know as the night went on. You know, we had Morris Williamson, of course, I was coming in from Russell, and we had all the other hosts coming in and doing their stuff, and I think we did a great job. Mm-hmm. Um, I've had so many comments from people who were saying that they so when we finished. At ten thirty, and they changed over to TV one or to 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 TV three. Just how appalling uh, it was, and you know, you had instances like Tover O'Brien, for example, who who was saying, you know, hand on heart and standing by the grave of a of a dearly departed. Who would have seen this result happening? Oh, come it, on, you know, come like on. it was obvious. But but I feel a bit flat because I watched Christopher Luxon and Seymour's. Uh, victory speeches, and I thought that they were rather presumptuous and also rather early because, you know, at that time that Luxon was declaring victory, he was looking at that like 41%. And then slowly over the next two or three hours, it crawled back to 38 point something. And I think that when the uh, specials come in, that National's going to lose at least one seat on the specials. They're at 50 seats at the moment. They think that they can govern uh, with the ACT Party uh, with their seats, uh, but it's a razor-thin majority, and you only need one uh, you know, dickhead MP to lose the plot or have shonky business dealings or something like that, and all of a sudden your majority's gone. And uh, it is rather presumptuous to to have to you know, declare that they're the winners when we don't know what the specials are. And and just let's put this in perspective. The special votes are estimated to be about 540,000 special votes. Now, the Electoral Commission always underestimates that by about fifty or 60,000. So there's likely to be around 600,000 special votes. So what's votes. that a percentage of the entire... Of the- well, that's a good question, and it's 20%. 20 percent. Twenty percent. Twenty percent of the vote has not been counted yet. Wow. Okay. So yeah. it, it's not going to change the outcome of the election. You know, the end of the tyranny, uh, but it is going to change how that government is going to be made up. And you know, just talking with uh, Matt McCartan uh, yesterday afternoon on my show. He's pretty certain that the Maori Party is going to pick up uh, Titai Tokarau and also uh, Tamaki Makaro. And that will then create an overhang. And of course, we've also got the by election. So uh, 61 is not going to be enough. And they are going to have to go cap in hand to Winston Peters. Well, that mm-hmm. we, well, that should, you shouldn't be feeling that flat then, Cam. Well, I think it's just the hiatus, you know, when you're living on Coca-Cola and adrenaline and putting together the show every week and doing all that sort of stuff, you you kind of don't poke your head above the parapet and then the election's finished and you poke your head up and you think, oh, okay, well, what next? And you realise that. Yeah, yeah, something like that. And, (laughs) and, you know, I've stopped drinking Coke as well and and so I don't have sugar and I don't have caffeine and, you know, maybe I just need to smoke a few more that's cigars. A whole, that's a whole nother show. <laughs> yeah, tell me about it. Um, uh, what was I going to say? In terms of the overall result, I guess why I feel a little flat is I've come to the realisation that, you know, so much can happen. We can be dicked around so much, unprecedented, and the needle only moves a little bit in yeah. the end. Mm-hmm. And, yep. and I don't want to lose faith in my fellow countrymen, but I kind of have, I've got to say. <laughs> yeah, 
I mean, I, I've, I've, I'm just going around talking to people. I think the mood of the country has lifted. I mean, it helps that the sun's come out, and I guess to people who voted green, that's um, and the All Blacks that's one. A sign of the, the global warming taking off. Now <laughs> nationals in charge, um, but I, I yeah, take a more positive sign than that. Um, and yeah, but I think I think New Zealand First is going to have more more leverage. Um, well, that's than, the only uh, bright spot. Forget the party, yeah. but the the offsetting of the of the tyranny is is a bright spot. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, if if we can start talking about that excess deaths up sixteen percent in the latest data, which was in August, and it, it, once that stuff starts coming out, and I think there's just general concern about well how do we let that out and that's a theme and i think maybe that's why you know if i if i've got any oh, any any feelings of of um, what, what we're saying feeling flat it's just because i know there's all that built up tension and and we we've, we've been living on so many lies and and there's there's this oh when the truth comes out it's, it, you can see it all in that that phrase malinformation, it's this kind of demonising of the truth. Yeah, um, and, and you know that that the truth will set us free. Well, the, and the, the gaslighting hasn't stopped though. I mean, on, on election night, Chris Hipkins was uh, saying we did so many things. We've lifted all of these kids out of poverty. Did they really? even bother to go and ask the parents of those kids, hey, how does it feel that your kid's out of poverty now? Because I bet you they're living in the same crappy house, in the same crappy suburb, going to the same crappy schools, doing the same crappy things. And their parents are sick and can't go to work at a well, 37% disability level. Yeah. yeah. And we've saved 20,000 people. You know, how do you square that with the excess deaths going up? Well, I'm going to be interviewing someone about that uh, early next week, and I can tell you that is so that use of that figure is so loosey goosey, it's laughable. Yeah, well, I mean, the the, the figure I'm using of 16 percent in August comes from uh, the world and data. Uh, I'm talking yeah. about the 20,000, the claim that 20,000 yeah, yeah, lives were yeah. saved. That's based on nothing. No, it's 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 it is disinformation, you know, and. The biggest uh, purveyors of disinformation, that is deliberate misinformation, was the government. And, you know, we've cut their throat. We've got rid of them. But like, you know, Rust, these guys never sleep. Uh, and, you know, you vote for government you look, still wins, Cam. Yeah. I mean, you look at at the electorate uh, races of the, uh, you know, what Labor lost. They lost half their seats. But but half of those people are still back in there because of the the list, which you know that is the system we're stuck with. Uh, MMP, it's never going to change. I don't think uh, I like MMP. No, it isn't. But 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 what staggers me, and it and it staggered me on how much time we as a radio station had to spend to educate people about the electoral system. Good point. For the first time, and we've had MMP for twenty-seven years. That's how dumb we are, and and it staggers me that that a lot of these minor parties, minor minor parties that were out there, battled on uh, when and when you look at the results that they got, right? And we gave them heaps of coverage. We we interviewed hundreds of candidates from all of those different parties and things like that. And the ones who didn't get interviewed, it's because they didn't want to be interviewed. Apparently we're yeah, traitors. No, they had, yeah, they had even more opportunity to get coverage uh, yeah. than but, they took. But, they, but like, and I discussed this again with, with Matt McCartan last night, and I said, he said, you know, Cam, the thing is, is you and I are realists. We look at polls, we look at the numbers, and we deal with reality. And, 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 you know, we, I cannot emphasize that enough. There's a lot of people out there, very, very good people, who were hoodwinked uh, by deluded leaders who thought something different. And I see, you know, uh, yesterday in the media uh, when Liz Gunn appeared in court and then afterwards did a stand up, she now says that the two million votes that they were going to get was all, she was just joking. Well, well, I, wa I watched when she said it, and she wasn't joking. 
Neither was she joking when she said, if everybody in Southland votes for us, we'll get the 5%, despite the fact there aren't enough electors in Southland to do that. So, you know, it, it, it annoys me immensely that we had an opportunity to get some really good quality candidates into Parliament and the narcissism and the... Histrionics uh, is another Histrionics good word. and everything around... Uh, these, you know, minor, look at Matt King, for example. I told him, you're not going to win. And we, we even commissioned a poll, and it said he'd come fourth. Uh, there was three other polls in Northland that said he'd come fourth. Go on, have a hazard a guess of where Matt King came in the voting. We, we, know, we know how that story Exactly. Up. Yeah. Right. Do you think, do you think um, and maybe this shows it up, that uh, we really need to have a look at ourselves as a nation. We've seen seem to have outsourced the responsibility for keeping reality in check to someone else. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, we we, we kind of need to right. just grow up and be adults for once. But, but we saw this during the pandemic, where everyone put their hand out for the government to put money into their pockets, and then also at the same time expected the government to tell them what to do. And we we actually crippled society in ways that we cannot imagine, but manifests itself in all sorts of ludicrous things. Like, for example, during the uh, Women's uh, Soccer World Cup, when a fire alarm went off at Eden Park and this absolute dolt of a man was on TV saying, nobody told us what to do when the fire alarm went off. Mm. Right, and they expect the government to tell them what to do. How do we get to this? How, how do we get to this? Well, when when the masks came off, when the masks went on, you know, you got to see who was who, and you know, the, I mean, they're still talking about COVID caused this. I mean, COVID was like a possum crossing the road, and the COVID response was driving off a cliff in an effort to avoid hitting it, basically, and. You know, I mean, I always use that um, figure of the 33% of registered Democrats who thought people who didn't get vaxxed should have their kids taken off them. I mean, there's a pathology in humanity that we've been able to ignore because we've had cheap energy and things are easy. But we're supposed to be the plucky, can-do, pioneering, well, that was a while back now, nation that, you know, can make use of number eight wire and... No more. Never lets anything it's get gone. in the way, and no, we're not. Mm. Yeah, that's I've been right. reading a bit of Confucius, and and that's instructive, you know, in terms of the the conscious building of culture, and that's what it's going to take. And I I don't know that Nationals got the um, imagination to do it. Um, Beck on trick. Yeah. Well, speaking of Beck on trick, the first thing he said he's going to do is cancel the. Um, the light rail, so those those that light rail is not even going to get on the track, not let alone back on it. Back well, that was track. a no-brainer anyway, wasn't it? To well, be that's fair, good. well, that's good because there's twenty odd billion dollars that were alloc- that was allocated in a some budget a few years ago. We can refill that back now and spend it on something more sensible, or I don't know. How about putting it back in the taxpayers' long-suffering taxpayers' pockets? Well, now, there's an idea. Out of the taxpayers' pocket. It got printed. Yeah, and exactly. we lined up the toilet paper money. And, yeah. um, you know, the first in line for the toilet paper money uh, are the big investment firms uh, like BlackRock. And, and I've, I've said this before, but I think that's where the missing money from the overseas buyer's tax is going to come from. They've just got all this toilet paper money. And uh, I think, yeah, they've probably said, hey, look, we can put billions of dollars in, into your economy to make, make your books balance. No worries. We but we give the stuff away. Mind you, you got to you pay a price for that. Oh, we pay a terrible price for it. It's, it's an unimaginative solution, but we're it's gonna, a corporate guy solution. We're going to be paying a price for what the, what was done in the last six years for at least a generation. We had um, a financial journalist from Australia on in our Money Talk segment yesterday, David James, and he said the problem is that uh, management has no conscience it doesn't need to have a conscience it only need it only has deliverables and you just 
get to those deliverables any way you can without conscience. That's the problem. Yeah, the rate of psychopathy in the general population is about 1%. I think in among CEOs, it's something like 15%. And, you know, you've got to be very suspicious anytime the government gives you a license to hate. And, uh, you know, a lot of people, uh, this has been a big part of the technique, they got given a license to hate. Women got given a license to hate men. Maori have been given a license to hate whitey. And, um, you know, if you're oh, weak in character, you take it, and uh, it has terrible consequences for you. What do you think about the media? Do you think they still, they seem to be carrying on like this never happened? Well, you know, the media uh, are acting like petulant children who have had their toys taken away, and, you know, in many respects, I guess they have. But, I mean, you know, had the Herald, who are probably one of the worst outfits out there, uh, run a, a an article uh, on the 18th about what's set to get cut under a National Act New Zealand First Government and then list all sorts of things like co-governance. Well, good. You know, that's what happens when you have an election. Uh, you have a contest of ideas and one person's or one team's ideas uh, get accepted and the others get uh, thrown out. We threw out the ideas of the Labour Party, the Green Party, and to Party Maori. We don't want that uh, recipe. The voters have spoken. There's a clear majority. It's about 55% of the population don't want co-governance. We don't want bans on offshore oil and gas exploration. We don't want agricultural emissions pricing. We don't want three waters. You know, we don't want the light rail. And these are all things that these liberal elite tosses in the media have lobbied for gone after, um, pr promulgated, all without actually asking the voters. And we finally have had the voters asked, and those solutions were found wanting, and the solutions of the National Party, the ACT Party, and New Zealand First were chosen above all else. And they need to get over themselves. But you know, the reality is I don't think that the media will get over themselves unless they suffer a fair bit of pain. Well, they'll and suffer so, pain because their business models are crumbling, and it's it's questionable as to whether most of them will still be in business in three years in the form well, they are now anyway. Well, they're, pro they're propped up by millions of dollars of state-funded advertising from government departments. You know, if I was Winston Peters sitting down with Christopher Luxon right now, I'd pull out my media UTU policy. And I'd say, right, what we need to do is get all the heads of all the heads of all the government departments in, put a moratorium on any government spending uh, with any media outlet for at least six months, turn that tap off while we sit down and work out how we're going to go forward. And then the next step of that would be to say, well, this is all public interest uh, advertising, so we're not going to pay for it anymore. Uh, the media can carry that free of charge. PSAs, public service announcements. Yep, and it's carry like it free of charge food. and and starve them of the thing that's kept them going that means that they don't listen to their audience. Yeah, it's a perfect storm for them. There's the, the prospect of losing that government funding. They're probably drinking a lot more booze because you need to if you're have to lie because it hurts your soul, <laughs> and um, and they've got national Take and uh, New Zealand first not saying anything. There was an amazing story on Tuesday in the Herald by Thomas Coughlin, um, where he wrote an intro that you, you looked all through the story. He wrote there was nothing in the story that related to his intro, and I, having worked, you know trying to sneak uh, colourful things through sub editors, it's pretty tough. They are the blander eyes. How would that have gone through then when there was no reference to the headline? Is that what you're saying? Well, well, no, there's no reference to the story. This is his intro. New Zealand First is looking to spook National into making early concessions before special votes have been counted, but National leader Christopher Luxon has signalled he might be ready to call the party's bluff and wait for the final results on November oh, whatever. the 3rd. whatever. There was that's nothing just total bollocks. all that is in the total story. That is total bollocks. Like I, yeah. It's like also the media are running at the moment that – Oh, you know, um, uh, National's going to use Jerry Brownlee because he's very friendly with Winston Peters. Well, anybody who knows the dynamic of those two knows that that's completely made up. It, it's not even close to being true. 
And uh, there's probably only two people in the National Party that Winston Peters would have any comfort with in dealing with, and that would be Todd McClay uh, and Mark Mitchell. And Mark Mitchell will be there because he's been in the parliamentary rugby team with these guys okay. from New Zealand first, right? Yeah. And at the same time, nobody in the media has picked up something that's bleedingly obvious is that guess who Christopher Luxon's next-door neighbour is? Okay. Like who? literally next door, David you, Seymour. Da- oh, really? Right? So there's this cosy little arrangement there with National and Act, and then there's you know a, a whole bunch of other cosy little arrangements that exist out there, like uh, Andrew Keetles, for example, the Chief of Staff, uh, of the ACT Party, and uh, his partner is Jenna Lynch from News Hub. So it's so it's so incestuous. Yeah, I was going to. I didn't want to say the word, but yeah, that's the word. The Wellington Central Green Wave. You know that really summed it up, didn't it? Just you, you guys who are all about taking money off us, telling us what to do, and blowing it on your little um, things to make you feel good. You know, all want to vote for a party that's essentially communist. Green Party um, welcomes new MPs, vows to fight for climate change, Māori te tiriti justice, is the headline I'm reading from October 18th. And there's a picture of James Shaw, Marama Davidson. Behind James Shaw, probably 90% young women and uh, a guy, and he can't be long for that world. Well, you know, the Green Party... Uh... Are, are as deluded as some others that are out there. They think that they had a stunning campaign, that they had brilliant policies, and that the voting public love them because we've got more MPs. That's literally, you know, the same as the gnomes in South Park who came up with a business plan to steal underplants, then something, and then make a profit. That was their three point plan. What the Greens don't understand is that they only got those numbers because the Labour Party was so rubbish. Yeah, so it was just a cannibalisation. Correct. Exercise, that, uh, like a seesaw. Yeah. Well, it's helped along by how uh, the education system sends people out into the world illiterate and incapable of critical thinking. Um, that That's on their side. In the same way as, you know, an upside of so many uh, Labour Party MPs being out of a job is I guess it'll help address the teacher shortage. Okay. <laughs> is, is that a good thing? <laughs> I don't know. I w- I'm not sure I'd want Jan Tanidi in a classroom. Just, just, um, just circling back quickly yeah, to uh, media, I see that um, in the New Zealand uh, TV Awards, Fire and Fury is a finalist in New Zealand On Air Best Documentary. Up against... No Māori allowed and inside child poverty revisited. What do we make of that? Box. How could that ever be a finalist in anything? They just can't stop patting, them, patting themselves on the back. But it takes no boxes of quality. Nothing. I mean, as you, as you say, Paul, it's, it's, we're, we're on the precipice of, of a major uh, collapse of the media. You know, once these... Mel, once this malinformation starts coming out, which is that people are actually getting sick and they're dying and they're having spontaneous abortions, um, you know, and and they knew some of that was going to happen. And rather than saying to doctors, hey, look, there's a risk of this. So if someone presents showing signs of myocarditis, um, you know, take it seriously and treat it. Instead, they sent them away saying, oh, you're probably just a bit anxious. Once that comes out, it's it's really going to change the uh, complexion of New Zealand. And that's why I, I say it's really important that we take the heat out of a lot of these things that arise from lies, whether it's the principles of the treaty or uh, you know there was. If you haven't listened to that interview old Rodney Hyde um, did with uh, Professor uh, uh, Elizabeth um, Rata, Rata, sorry, yeah, yep. um, it, it's incendiary. It was um, really uh, gently put, but uh, well worth a listen when you consider how much has flowed out from Jeffrey Palmer basically saying, oh, it's just window dressing. 
Well, and, and you know, in that, in that is also been exacerbated by John Key uh, signing us up to UNDRIP, you know, and and that had consequences that f- flowed from that. I mean, Matt McCartan was talking, you know, and I keep harping on about, it, but he, you know, he knows a lot of stuff, and he was saying to me that he thinks that the the win of the Maori Party in the Maori seats is baked in, that Labor aren't going to get those back. Oh, really? Okay. And that concerns me immensely because the Maori Party of Tariana Turia and Peter Sharples no longer exists. We've got a Maori Party that is deeply Marxist in its outlook. And angry, ra- right? They're angry. Angry, angry. And, and racist uh, against everybody. They call people colonizers and, you know, settlers and all sorts of derogatory terms. Right, uh, where he said we consider them subhuman. He said that. <laughs> In well, yeah. that's, that's a bloody given, debate. Given permission to hate, mm. you, you know, it's a dangerous thing. And if you get permission to hate from your government, you better take a real hard look at your character mm. and what they stand to gain uh, yeah, from yeah. that. I mean, that, you know, what was good about my discussion with Matt McCartan is he said, look, Cam, we need to have growing up discussions about this. You know, it, it isn't about... Uh, you know, trying to force everybody into their way of thinking. That's never going to work. And that's what concerns me is I'm, I think we're going to see increased activism, uh, increased, uh, and, you know, attacks on people who aren't Maori. But, but Morris Williamson raised it, you know, on the panel with us at the beginning of the week, uh, Paul, when he said, what is a Maori? Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, what is, what, what is a Maori? Because, because, Everybody in New Zealand's made up of a genetic makeup of lots of different things. And, and Fiji went through this. And, and, you know, I was born in Fiji and I consider myself you are Fijian. a Fijian. That is what, that's what, uh, Vanaka Vakalevu. That's what, uh, love that country, by the way. Frank Biney Marima said when, when he had his coup, we, we're going to have one standard of citizenship for the whole country. If you're born in Fiji, you're a Fijian. Right, you may be Itaukai, you may be of Indian extraction, or you might be like me, who who, you know, is from European extraction. Um, but I'm not a Kaivalangi. I, that that's a foreigner. I'm not. I was born in Fiji. I'm Kaiviti, and we need to have the same sort of uh, same sort of discussion in New Zealand and get rid of this talk of separate this and separate that. Can you see? It's not about separatism. Can you see a, a an administration led by Christopher Luxon with his back on track, you know, smoothing smoothing that over? Well, no. well I think he's just so incredibly woke that he'd entertain it. I, I know. Woke that, is weak. That he we was say. having discussions with the Maori Party several months ago. Uh, they ultimately but he ruled them were, out, Cam. He ruled I, them out. That's right, he did. But he was having discussions with them. And okay. uh, you know they, he did rule them out, and but he had discussions with them. Well, he's um he's taking the money from the decommissioned uh, Maori Health Authority and giving it to Iwi. I've I've got the figure here somewhere. It's it's hundred and what is it? One hundred and forty seven million or something. No, it's Maybe, kind of uh, same old, sorry, same old, same old. Well, I mean, different label kind of thing, is it? Yeah, and again. You've got to have an understanding of the way pre-European Maori society work to understand the complexion of the the way it's reflected in New Zealand's politics. Winston Peters uh, is representing the tutua, the commoners, who basically really quite liked the treaty because it conferred on them that an Englishman's home is his castle, yeah. right of ownership, which they didn't have before. They existed at the pleasure of the of um, John Tamahiri, his um, yeah. niche. Um, and, and so when he says, you know, we're going to be ruling these people, uh, you know, that's what he meant. And and so that radical faction has taken Tino Rangatiratanga to mean um, Maori as an ethnic group uh, get to rule themselves when it meant uh, that, yeah, a- again, every man is his... Uh, Every an Englishman's home is his castle, that you could have right of ownership. 
Willie Jackson not committing to serving a full three-year term in Parliament, but he says, and I'm reading here from Te Ao Māori News, he will stay on to consolidate Labour's Māori caucus and to work with Te Pāti Māori and the Greens to prevent what he says will be an attack on our people, an attack on our people under a national and act government. An attack? Well, he didn't just say work with either, uh, Paul. He said organise with, Oh, organize. Which, is a, which is a very loaded kind of lefty. But what uh, is, and, but what is our he, people, right? Because Willie Jackson's got uh, Jewish uh, genetic DNA in him. He, he, he had a test. A, a DNA test done, and oh, hello, it threw up a bit of Jewish uh, DNA. So what does he mean by an attack on our people? I mean, this is just bollocks. And, and our people, where's the equivalence? What's his net worth? Well, it's millions. Okay. Right. But does, well, that mat- does, it, does that matter? I mean, I don't well, care Well, when you're talking about worth. our people, you're kind of making it sound like you're down there in the working class fighting the battle. Duh. No, he's not. Yeah. Yeah, that's a fair point. He doesn't and, have any insecurity um, in life in in those terms at all. He's well, he doesn't have it. poor health outcomes because he's educated. Well, he did have a heart so, bypass, mind you, so, so did I. So. He, well, he probably uh, got prompt treatment for it because he turned up to his appointment because he's got the education to know that if you don't, you're in the crapper. And uh, it's not that the health system's prejudiced against Māori. It's that uh, they have a higher rate of did not attends. Um, I've got a I've got a bit of time for Willie Jackson, and you might be sitting there rolling your eyes, going, well, "Well, no, no, that's okay." You know, I, I've I've had a bit of respect for him. You know, he he involved me in his radio show when he was on, and you know, I've had some quite very a few years good, ago now, Cam. Yeah, sure, but I've had some just good discussions with him, and, and it disappoints me when he comes up with statements like this because he's better than that. But isn't that where the money is? That's kind of what I was alluding to. I mean, this talk about it, you know, he says he thought there was going to be an attack on Maori. Well, he might be right and that there'll be an attack on Maori, but I I think he left a couple of words out, out, like I think he left out elites or something like that because what I can see happening in the coalition negotiations is Christopher Luxon saying to Winston Peters or Winston Peters saying to Christopher Luxon more likely these are the areas that we want to take portfolios in and then go after the woke and the weak and the and the racism and stand up for that uh, for every Kiwi saying that, you know, for instance, let's see, you know, I can imagine seeing Shane Jones as the energy minister and that will just unhinge the Greens hugely. Yeah, it could be pretty uh, funny. I, I can yeah, see Casey watch, Costello... Yeah. Uh, being Minister of Maori Affairs and Shane Jones um, helping her and saying, well, that's nonsense. We're not we, we don't need that. Maori Affairs Ministry anymore. We don't even need those seats. The proportion of representation exceeds the... the 25% pop- of so Parliament What the is hell Maori. are we talking about here? It's over for that. Yeah. 25% of, the, of Parliament is Maori. That's what yeah. MMP has delivered and, and it's done a, a, a very fine thing. And f- I'm okay with that, but hey... It can't go on beyond a certain threshold. Otherwise, there's no credibility in your system. But, well, the, well, the other point the other point that you could make is, you know, if you took away race-based funding, would Māori uh, outcomes get worse? Could they conceivably get worse than 50% of the prison muster being Māori and the terrible rates of um, failure within the school system? Would it change the diets of people? The health? I, I think they'd get better. <laughs> you know, anything that's race-based is never going to work. Yeah. It's never and, and worked I anywhere in the world. Would... Yeah. I, I, I saw a comment this morning. I was reading through some, because I've been looking at um, some Moana Maniapoto's um, uh, interviews, which have been quite interesting, but, you know, she's got the usual visceral hatred for Whitey. And, and, you know, characterised the resistance to um, co-governance as uh, radical white people um, scaring uh, ordinary white people rather than that uh, it's a terrible idea that it's always leads to rape, murder and... Uh, 
But it's the language they use, Marty, isn't it? I mean, look at at uh, what Willie Jackson is saying. He says there's going to be an attack on Maori. He says there's going to be a real attack on our people over the next couple of months, and I'm not going to just leave that to them. They're going to need a lot of support. Now, what he means by that is that there's going to be some robust debate. That's not an attack on Maori. That's not people going out in the street with axes and, you know, batons and bottles and attacking Maori. That's having a debate that we've been denied for the last six months, six years. You know, they foisted separatism onto this population, whether it was through mandates or it's through co-governance, through three waters, through the splitting of the health system. They forced that on us and they didn't ask anybody. And no. now when we're going to have a, a proper debate about these things, all of a sudden it's an attack on Mary. No, it's not. It's a discussion. Mm. And and if you can't grow up, Willie Jackson, and have a discussion without reverting to racist tropes uh, to push your agenda, well, then you don't belong in the discussion. I mean, they play this game so much better than we do because they've got that idea that language constructs everything, that constructionist idea. But, yeah, the dog whistles, the dog whistles. I mean, it's and, and it's, you know, part of that, they're always doing what they accuse you of. I mean, a dog whistle that I notice that I haven't seen anyone else talk about is um, the uh, Hana um, uh, Rafiti Mapi, Maipi Clark, um, you know, in a red beret, you know, and it's like, oh, yeah, well, it's sort of, you know, but it, I always think it's a it's a bit of a nod to that that uh, former ANC Youth League president and current South African politician Julius Malema, you know the guy killed the boer, killed the farmer. Yeah, in the sports stadium. Yeah, yeah like that's that. a dog whistle. I'm um, speaking of dog whistles. Race relations calls time on abuse of Wahini Maori politicians. A new study new study confirms anti Maori bias, and this is an acting race relations commissioner. Are saying here, and I'm reading from msn.com, um, that uh, protection is needed against abuse and violence directed at them and their whanau. And what they say here is, I think that needs to be taken up by Parliament. It's not just physical violence, it's also through social media. What physical violence? Yeah. yeah I don't recall well. hearing anything reported. But I'd absolutely condemn it. Um, yeah, but but where if, is, if there is no physical violence, you can't say it's not just physical violence. If there hasn't been any, some some old National Party supporter did poke his head into someone's house. Well, that's what they're citing. Well, that's not violence. Uh, I mean, this. I guess I'm sounding a little exercise because this gins up the tension. It creates yeah. in people's minds. Um, it's uh, meant to. I know. Uh, and, and it works, you can see. Yeah, it's, it's but it's that, BS. It's bullshit. It's just it's bullshit. That upward pointing fist, Paul. You know, that's the sign of of the Marxist revolutionary. It means what the means justify the ends. Violence against your oppressor is uh, is what you should do. Yeah, and they'll lie about it. And, and I hope we, you know, part of this taking the pressure out, I think, is acknowledging, yeah, it would be great to see Māori do better. It would be great to see the education system working for them. That was why I was so disgusted when one of the first moves when Labor got in was to to take away, to dis- um, establish charter schools because they were actually working for a lot of those kids who had been failed by the unionist mm. uh, education well, system. Well, that was the teacher unions yeah, yeah, there, right, making that happen. Well, which is to say, it was the Labor Party, right? Yeah, because yeah. the two are same. Yeah, okay. But they've it's always your- got to pay back the unions, the Labor Party. That that's the thing is, you know, they're lurking there underneath the Labor Party all the time. I mean, you know, I, I I've had some information come to me. I have no reason to disbelieve it. That you know, earlier in the year when Jacinda Ardern was still the Prime Minister, she had a Zoom conference call with all the union leaders. She uh, you know, got them all on there and she said, look, guys, uh, we don't think we can win this election, but we're really going to need your help to give it a good go. And they said, oh, yeah, well, what do you want? 
and they and she said, look, you know, there's you know the nurses and the doctors and teachers and all the pay rounds are all coming up this year before the election. It'd be really, really helpful to us if you could make those reasonable uh, and and not uh, you know have any strikes or anything like that. That will just you know annoy people. And uh, you know they went on for for quite some time, and then the meeting ended, and then there was another Zoom meeting that was. Uh, started immediately afterwards without Jacinda Ardern, where they all said, you know, stuff that. If uh, they don't think they're going to win, that means the Nats are coming in and we won't get any pay rises with those guys, so we'll go to the doctor. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, that's exactly what happened. We saw those pay rises. Uh, Andrew Little uh, was sitting there trying to, you know, sort out the health system and the pay rises, and they just caved. They just caved. Yeah. But those costs, those increased costs, are now baked in because of that. Um, and, and the rise in minimum wage, the rise, and the, they saw that as, you know, kind of a Parthian shot. You know, as they're off, just just making it mm. more difficult for uh, for the incumbent government to succeed. It's terribly cynical in a way that you don't, ex- you know, you wouldn't do yourself, so you can't. Well, it's like it's like putting booby traps in, you know. Yeah. Um, it's just like landmines. Yeah. Um, I mean, Richard Preble, you know, wrote. I don't know if you caught his um, his column on Wednesday in the Herald. He was basically saying that um, Luxon should let ACT take the tough jobs and catch the flack. He patronizingly said, "Oh, and you know, if Winston's part of it, he could make the gold card better or something." But you know, and poor I think old Prebs, eh? Poor old yeah, yeah. Um, um, Should we talk about these? Um, we we got to talk about these small parties as well. I, I did a quick scan read of the judgment of, you know, the um, NZ loyal thing and their where it fell to pieces on list candidates. And one thing mm. I did pick up from it, and there's a lot of detail in there to to digest. But how loose, how loosey goosey. <laughs> The whole thing was there really wasn't any checking or serious engagement with finding out, you know, what you had to do. You know, what was the vibe of the thing? The T's <laughs> that needed to be crossed, the I's that needed to be dotted, and um, which tells me that you can't be that serious if if you neglect. It's those. not. It's not hard to do, and no other political party, including Leighton Baker and and Democracy New Zealand or any, had any sort of problem. Right, no other party had a had a problem, but NZ Loyal did. Yeah, and you know, then to listen to Liz Gunn saying, you know, the Electoral Commission has a job to do. Its job is to help um, these smaller parties. Well, that's a heroic assumption about what the Electoral Commission is 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 there to do. They're there to actually enforce the Electoral Act, administer, that's... administer and enforce the Electoral yeah. Act. Right, that's their job. But their job isn't to babysit. Uh, the newbies, um, newbies, the newbies who who haven't learnt uh, even the basics of MMP. But right? when you it's sit not... down, when you sit down, and say, "Okay, guys, we need to do this. This is the serious part of it." Okay, what do we need to do? Line item by line item, check off everything, make sure it's done. Well, I mean, you just have a look at some of the policy development that went on in these small small parties. You know, Liz Gunn herself. Uh, basically picked up a whole lot of Fruit Loop policies and everybody uncritically said, oh, this is great. It's like the 1% transaction tax. You know, this will work. Well, that's social credit. That was their idea. It's it's never had any uh, pickup anywhere in the world where it's successful, where it works, where, where it would even, you know, even get any sort of semblance of support in New Zealand. It's It's Looney Tune stuff. But we were told this was going to solve the problems of the world, you know, and and that's the that what they haven't realised a lot of these minor parties is that in the contest of ideas, they lost. It doesn't mean the ideas were dumb; it means they didn't sell them properly. And you know, you can't expect the media to be your friends. We learnt that uh, with the Wellington protest: the media are our enemies; they're not our friend. So if you're sitting there moaning now that you didn't get in because the media didn't give you a fair go, well, you knew that before you even got started. What what could have been the strategy to do better? Well, Winston, Winston's strategy, 
He just did everything on Twitter and Facebook and bypassed the media and refused to talk to them. And and it worked. And he's, you know, it's that old thing of people uh, overestimate what they can do in the short term and underestimate what they can do in the long term. And um, they, 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 they wanted to get there and they were looking for a Donald Trump kind of miracle, but forgetting that he had that kind of profile that fit with, and he did the yeah. work. Boy, yeah. did he do the work. You, I mean, you know, yes, they held public meetings. Yes, they knocked on doors. And, you know, I'm sure Matt King worked his ass off, right? But you're up against the machine, and it takes generations you know, to, to get there. Like, New Zealand First has been in existence for 30 years, and they've got the result of eight seats. So why did anybody, Leighton Baker, Liz Gunn, Matt King, all of these people, why did they think that they were going to get five seats or four seats or eight seats uh, when they haven't even been in existence for five minutes electorally? The ACT Party has been in existence for longer than New Zealand First, 36 years to get to the point that they're at. The Green Party has been there since the Values Party 50 years to get to the point where they're at. It's a it's a hard slog starting a new party and going, we've got these cool ideas, vote for us, doesn't work. Mm. Yeah, I've drawn the analogy. It's a bit like trying to cook bacon fast. You know, it doesn't bacon doesn't transmit heat in the same way as passionless kiwis don't tend to transmit enthusiasm that well. You've got to just slowly warm them. Yeah. Yeah, you know, if the pan's too hot, the bacon gets crispy and it's horrible. Nobody likes it. Yeah, you, that. you can feel a lot of energy at at, at the pan level and think, uh, well, the whole the whole rasher must be heating up, but no, yeah. it's not. Yeah. Um, uh, do you think that there's um, any hope for any of those parties, or they just dissipate? They just evaporate into nothing now. Well, you know, looking at the Facebook comments and, uh, you know, we've started this movement, it's a, it's going to grow, it's going to rah, rah, rah. You know, I, I admire their enthusiasm, I really do. Uh, but uh, three years uh, in the wilderness uh, and the issues that, you know, galvanised you uh, dissipate over time, uh, and at the same time, you've got political parties that are in the parliament that will make some inroads on some of the things that galvanise support for you, particularly around a COVID inquiry and those sorts of things. Mean means that your support's going to wane, and New Zealand First support and X support is going to grow, and that's just the way I see it going. And you know, I could be wrong, and I've been known to be wrong, but. Hey, I make um, I make a living talking about this sort of stuff, uh, and if I was wrong all the time, uh, then uh, you know I wouldn't have much of a living. Mm. Yeah, I, I think that the collapse has been um, hasn't been particularly graceful, which would have helped longevity. Uh, you know, there, there's as I said, there's been a fair bit of histrionics, uh, mm. and um, yeah, I, I think. What Cam said earlier about the, that kind of surety that there was going to be some kind of miracle has effectively resulted in two or three or maybe four really good candidates who were all on board with telling the truth, exactly. not being in Parliament when they could have been. Mm. Here's a question. This is a bit navel gazy. Do you think we made any difference anywhere? Yeah, I think we did. What? How many percent do you reckon, Cam? I don't know about percent, but I think we did make a difference. Uh, you know, we we interviewed a whole lot of people who would never have made it to any uh, media ever, right? We we talked to all sorts of candidates uh, across the various different political parties, and we educated people. We particularly focused on the issue of wasted vote. And that, that upset some people. Boy, that was like pulling teeth. But but I think we did, we, if I look at the coverage across the mainstream media, they didn't cover anywhere near the number of candidates that we did. 
they didn't cover anywhere near the parties that we. And we did long form stuff. We did, it wasn't just on the surface. It was like, yeah, yeah everything well, we could think of, we asked. Yeah, when I shared, uh, and I often shared the crunch. I'm a big fan of the crunch. I always make sure, by the way, Thanks, and man. enjoy it. Just like I'm loving your world news at the moment, Paul. It's the best world news uh, available on New Good Zealand. Good to know. Media. Thank you. And uh, the crunch is the best political journalism in in New Zealand uh, and receives zero government funding, which probably isn't a coincidence. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing is that we let these guys talk. We let people talk, right? If you have a look at the way the mainstream media does things, it's combative. It's uh, confrontational. Uh, it's like, you know, sticking camera in Winston Peters' face when he arrived at the at Wellington Airport on uh, on Wednesday. You know, what was the point of that? You know, trying to get reactions. Well, it's part of the game show, isn't it? Yeah, it, it, yeah. yeah. but we sat down with candidates and, like, I, look, I think one of the best interviews that I had uh, was with Hecker Robertson from Vision uh, New Zealand uh, in Wellington, and uh, and also on the the week before the election um, with uh, Kane, who runs the Man Up program. I, yeah, I just, cracker. you know, I I felt um, energized by speaking with them for an hour or so, right? And uh, we that's what we do, and that's that's why we're better than everybody else because. Everyone, all the other mainstream media go, oh, well, you're a flea candidate in, you know, um, some place that no one's ever heard of, so we're not going to talk to you. But we talked to those people, and we heard what they had to say. And, and it was bloody interesting. It, it is, you know. And, yeah. and some of them I felt sorry for them because I just knew they weren't going to get there. Yeah. Uh, I you knew, did well not saying that uh, too brutally, though. Well, I, I didn't want to. I wanted to understand the person that I was talking to, not the character that the media has portrayed. And, you know, the discussion that I had with Brian Tamaki uh, about crime and, and law and order and the law and order policy, that's another example. I, I think he had some good things to say and they're mm -hmm. worth saying. Just because it's Brian Tamaki doesn't mean we should turn our ears off. Um, you know, there's a lot of things I don't like about Brian Tamaki. But it's not my job to tell everybody that I don't like those things about Brian Tamaki. It's my job to have a discussion with that person, let them explain what their policy is or their, where their, what their core beliefs are, and let the listeners uh, make their own Well, that's up. what we're all about. That's, yeah. the, that's the mission, as I say. Do you think we added – here's another sort of kind of navel-gazy question. Do you think we added – uh, in the end, to the New Zealand first vote total in any way? I think we did. And, you know, when I interviewed Winston on election night, uh, it was the only one-on-one -on -one interview he's given uh, since the election. Uh, he hasn't given any other one-on-one -on -one interviews, hasn't been on any other TV or, or radio or anything else. He was effusive in his thanks to the listeners of Reality Check Radio. And if he's thanking the listeners of Reality Check Radio, I guess he's thanking the station as well. Mm. And, you know, even if you compare his interviews that he had on uh, with Sean Plunkett and that, you know, he was on with us. Uh, you know, Paul, you spoke to him for quite four a considerable time. Yeah, four, four times. Four times. Uh, mm -hmm. It would have been half an hour more or more each time. I spoke exactly. to Winston twice. Yeah. It was an hour each time. So people got to hear the real Winston Peters, the Winston Peters that I've, you know, known over 30 or 40 years. Uh, they got to see beyond the headlines and beyond the mainstream media uh, and how they paint them, and I think that helped. And I don't do anything different. You know, here's the thing, right? I asked uh, probably 30 national MPs, to come on my show. I asked a probably 10 or so Labour MPs to come on the show. I asked David Seymour and some ACT MPs and ACT candidates. And every single one of those, apart from Mark Mitchell, either didn't reply to to our to us asking 
or uh, or just said no. Whereas every uh, candidate from a smaller party that I asked on, including New Zealand First, as soon as I said, you know, would you like to come on the show, was yes. And they were there. Yeah. There's no coordination. Uh, no, at that's all. right. And it's so, important you know, the listeners understand that because we had did get that. Oh, I'm getting a bit sick of pushing New Zealand first. I and mean, for me, it was like, I'm getting sick of the lies. And mm. at this stage, they're the only game in town that's mm. willing to call bullshit on the bullshit. And, um, and, and so, you know, I'd never voted for New Zealand first. I, I, and I hadn't really understood the, uh, I said this on a couple of occasions, the extent to which the decision to uh, install the Marxist student politicians who didn't have any work experience in charge of a whole country. Um, I didn't understand the extent to which that was a caucus decision rather than a Winston Peters decision. And that ameliorated my, um, mm. my rage at, at it a, a little bit. And I didn't understand the extent to which national had been inept in, in negotiating with them. Um, so yeah, I wasn't left, and and you know, then I, I know Kirsten Murphy uh, personally, and and I uh, know that she's there for all the right reasons, and would rather not be there, and has got a career where she'd earn more money if she wasn't there, and dealing with a whole lot of stuff at home too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that you know that never came came out really. Um, yeah, we had David Seymour once. I don't think he enjoyed the experience. And um, like you say, Cam, we reached out to all the leaders, all the players. We were so nice about it, so mm. inclusive. And I think most of them didn't even reply. So It reminds me a bit of, uh, you know, I think I mentioned The Godfather <laughs> earlier, but that scene in The Godfather 2 where Michael Corleone sees the rebel in Cuba blow himself up and he tells a story uh, and he says, well, you know, the soldiers get paid to fight, but mm. uh, the rebels just do it because they believe in it. That means they can win. And I think the uh, mainstream media will be looking across at Reality Check Radio and thinking much the same thing. I wonder what they think of us. Well, I don't well, really care what they think of us. No, we're I know, doing but what you know, doing. Just, um, I mean, I've got that background, so I know what it's like. And I know yeah. what the attitude is to, to new players, and not many that come along. And you, you wonder what they're thinking. Because okay. one thing's for sure, there have been no hit pieces. None. No, not one. I, you know, and, I, I, and there's a reason I'm for no, that. Yeah, you and know, I'm known as somebody who does hit pieces, right? But not one of my interviews did I attack anybody. Yeah. You're changed, man, Cam. <laughs> <laughs> Something's something happened. But yeah. no one's done it on us, is the point I'm making. Yeah. And we are fair game, man. Well, we, we're sort of just probably uh, coming into the out of the first they ignore you phase, and uh, they're, they're probably looking for an opportunity. You know to why? Because we're doing the... what they dream of doing. Yeah, that's why. Yeah, I think we should finish up on a light note, and I'm going to play some of this because I think it's worth hearing again. I put it in the the news yesterday, and this is the Canadian opposition leader Pierre Polyev smacking down as people are saying while he's eating an apple while he's eating an apple <laughs> so yeah. cool so laid back yet such a heavy punch to this guy i think it says it all so i'm going to play this and then uh, well some of it anyway and then i want to come and get a, just a few comments a at the end before we wind it up are you okay with that yeah, yeah here we go um on the on the topic i mean in terms of your sort of strategy currently you're obviously taking the populist uh pathway um what does that mean <laughs> well ap appealing appealing to people's uh, more emotional levels i would guess um i mean what certainly you mean certainly that? you Give certainly you tap certainly you tap uh, very strong ideological language quite frequently like what uh left wing you know this and that right wing they, you know i mean it's that that type I of ideological thing i never really talk about left but or right anyways a lot i don't of really believe in that okay a lot of people would would say that you're simply taking a page out of the Donald Trump uh, well, book. Like which people would say that? Well, I'm sure a great many Canadians, but like who? <laughs> I don't know who, but well, you're um, the one who asked the question, so yeah. I, you must know somebody. <laughs> okay, I'm I'm sure there's some out there, but anyways, some the the point of this the point of this question is, I mean, why should why should Canadians trust you with their vote, given you know? 
not not just the sort of ideological inclination in terms of taking the page of Donald Trump's book, but also... What are you also, talking about? What page? What page? Can you give okay. me a page? Give me the page. You keep <laughs> in, saying in terms, that. In terms of tur turning things quite dramatically in terms of, of Trudeau and, and the left wing and all of this, I mean, you, you, you make quite a, you know, it's, it's quite a play that you make on it. So I'm, I'm not sure. I don't, under, I don't know what your question okay. is. Okay, then forget that. Why should Canadians trust you with their vote? And so it goes on. <laughs> Yeah, it's a I mean, masterclass, you, isn't it? A masterclass. Uh, if you're going to come picking. to what do they say, a, a, a gunfight, don't bring a knife, you know. But but I mean that's the thing is they make these truisms. You know they say things. Oh, you're a populist. What does that mean? I mean he came back at him with brilliant. Well, what does that mean? So give me an example. And, and a page out of Trump's book. What what page? Well, what page? Give me a page. <laughs> give me a page. Yeah. It I mean, just if, made the guy look like a complete fool, which he was. There's that glibness, isn't there, um, where there's just this accepted reality that doesn't bear close scrutiny or questioning. And, I mean, you could do the same thing about climate change. You could do the same thing about the COVID response. You could do the same thing. But we've, we've got this terrible situation where journalists don't ask those kind of questions and the education system doesn't prime people to be curious in that way. And uh, so we're just hurtling for a wall. I'd love to see some, you know, some responses like that to our our journalists, you know, because it's they're so easily taken apart. It's, yeah, but, but who could do it? You know, you think about it, there's only one Winston. name that comes. That, exactly. It's the one name that comes to mind. I mean, David Seymour wouldn't be able to do that. I don't think Christopher Luxon well, He'd say could something do it. snarky, uh, personal and snarky that wouldn't be funny. Yeah. Probably. I mean, you have to actually have your wits about you to do something like that. And, uh, and, and you know, this is the problem with MMP, is that we've actually dumbed down our MPs. And, they, you know, they're so anodyne, they're so, uh, you know, polished up into nothingness. They're, they're too scared to actually say something. And, uh, you know, I think that is the fault of MMP where, we're going constantly for the middle ground, but no one knows what the middle ground is, so we better not. Um, we don't want to upset anybody. I don't and know that we've dumbed, dumbed them. Sorry, Paul. I, no, I don't no, know you if we them down. There's there's a selection process that eliminates people like that, and, and it eliminates uh, conscious uh, conviction politicians. Yeah, and, and convict. There's very few conviction politicians. And it turns out that after 30 years, most New Zealanders don't even know how it works still yeah. fundamentally. I mean, I mean, it's okay to be woken up. And, you know, people talk about, I've, I've been woken up about the political system. But that, in, in many respects, that's all they did is wake up. What they didn't do is, is the, you know, it, I mean, I, the feedback I had on my show from people who would argue the toss about, you know, what I was thinking about something or how something was going to operate or how it did actually operate. And and I get this all the time. People want to come up to me in the street and they say, you know, you, uh, you're wrong on that. Uh, yeah, no, I'm not. Um, <laughs> no, I'm not. So it's like you know, they You've got to be up. chewing an apple, chewing on an apple to get that yeah. one right. But it's like they woke up and then put their fingers in the ear, ears and shouted la 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 when everyone when anybody pointed out the reality of situations to them. Yeah, and then got angry. That... And then got angry, and you know, oh, we should be doing this and we should be doing that. Look, I've had it for years, and when I ran whale oil and the BFD, I've had it for years. People would say to me, you know, you should be supporting the National Party, and because you're not, I'm cancelling my subscription. Um, but I want nothing more to do with you. Well, you know what? In almost every instance that somebody did that. They never had a subscription. Okay. They were You're just being bombastic and bullying and threatening. And, you know, you you have to look yourself in the mirror. You have, you know, especially doing what I do, you have to be able to be, to look yourself in the mirror and say, well, I actually didn't mislead anybody here. This is this is the truth. This is reality. In, in some ways, we're in a bubble, but the bubble is not about the information. The bubble is about the sort of people who do say, "Hey, this is this is not right. This is unacceptable, and this is not going in a good direction for everyone." And uh, right at the outset of um, the COVID response, 
I went to I uh, went to a dinner. Uh, I think it might have been at Jody Brunning's place, and I think she said to me, "You know, everyone who's uh, who's against this is an outsider. They've been an outsider as a child." And um, interesting. I think I think that's if, if you if you tap into how what people's backgrounds are, that's often true. I changed I'm schools to about of, four times. I'm thinking of myself now. Was I? What was I? I've Maybe always I been an outsider. Yeah. Yeah, comfortable not being in the herd. Yeah. And uh, it, it's hard for people who are comfortable not being in the herd to really fully understand the terror a of, lot of, of people feel. Of leaving when, it. Of when they're threatened it. with exclusion from the herd. It, it's yeah. a very powerful force. And it's like Matt Shelton told me, and I think he's right, and we talked about this, that if you're inside that herd and you see people who are not part of the herd, and especially if it's a, a medical thing where there's fear of death, you're kind of seen as dead already to them. Yeah. Yeah, that zebra is going to get eaten. By the, if they did an experiment where they marked a zebra so they could study how they moved in the herd, and the zebra that was marked got nailed because the lions <laughs> could kind of keep an eye on them and 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 follow them specifically. Right. Murderers. Murderers. <laughs> any, any last words? Any, any last words, chaps? Well, I think that things are going to get interesting when the special votes come in. We're going to see that last 20% of the vote. I think there's going to be some changes. I don't think National is going to be as ascendant as they think they are. Uh, we are going to have a three-way government. Um, that's not a bad thing. In fact, that's what we've mostly had uh, under MMP. Uh, so the National Party lines about getting on with it. We have to fix things fast. We can't wait. We, it, it, It's just... PR and spin and ultimately anti-democratic and I think we do have to wait for the specials it's part of the voting system, it's how it works, it's not long, it's only two weeks and uh, on the day after my birthday we'll uh, we'll find out what, what it actually looks like Is the most temperamental and staunch party in a three party set up the one that has the power in the end because they're the one who could flip at any moment, uh, what I'm thinking is if, again NZ first, if you know, if there are some bottom lines that won't be met, um, there's not much the other two can do. Well, bottom well, assuming line, it's bottom, ended first. Well, bottom lines is a media construct. Well, they they seem to have. They could be the more grumpy, is what I'm thinking. Yeah, but again, you can only deal the, ha- the deal. You can only play the cards you've been dealt. Yeah, and this is the perennial problem with the NZ first, and indeed the ACT Party. In the ACT Party, they've they've normally only been dealt one card, and New Zealand First has only been dealt five or six. And so, when you're really small, uh, you really can't. And that's the thing that people who hate Winston Peters say: they I never honours his promises. Well, did you vote for him? No. Well, then why are you complaining? <laughs> well, he never honours his promises. Well, you didn't vote for him to give him the power to be able to negotiate. This time round is a little bit different. Yes, he said, ruled out uh, Labour and doing anything with them, and they're out of the game anyway. There's no way that anything can happen in that respect. But they've got more MPs than they've had, you know, for a, a while, and so and National actually does need them. Uh, so yeah, so he can say, look, we want this inquiry. Oh, we want to water it down. No, if you water it down, this won't happen. This won't happen. This won't happen. Yeah, the, and, the, and I think he can do those things. And, you know, in my interview uh, that I had with him after the election results were known, that's the one thing he focused on. He, he really thinks uh, that there has been a huge injustice to many people. And come and he's got a plan for if, if National doesn't agree with, a, with an inquiry, well, that's all right. I'll, he said to me, you'll just use parliamentary questions and ask them over and over yeah. and over again until we get questions answered. Okay. And National is actually, it's in their best interest to actually allow an inquiry because they can completely have clean hands. They can have the inquiry, uh, you know, Christopher Hipkins and Jacinda Ardern and Ashley Bloomfield and all of those people can be dragged before the inquiry. They can be made to answer. And it will destroy the Labour Party. They must and, be crapping themselves. Well, they 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 should be because I mean and Andrew Little, Andrew yeah. Little's now you know quit, 
uh, he's not going to be an MP. He can see the writing on the wall. He was the health minister, <laughs> right? So he can happily, now that he's no longer an MP, come before an inquiry and throw all of his all of his fellow people under the bus to save his own skin. So I think that, that we should have that. This could I be think, a great show. Oh, absolutely. And imagine it over a year. It's death by a thousand cuts. Yeah. Marty, any last words? Uh, the truth will set us free. You know, just keep keep pushing the truth and looking for the truth and mm. uh, and being uh, genuinely kind. Oh uh, no, I totally agree with that. I, I yeah. think that'll uh, I think that'll get us through. Yeah. And I, I I really hope you know if, uh, we, we we can make a place where Maori can um, can understand that that by seeing a. Uh, uh, People like us as allies, they're not um, we're not bashing Maori, we're bashing bullshit and, and lies. There's our post election Friday political panel. I want to thank Cam Slater and Marty Gibson for being here this Friday morning. We've got a long weekend now. I've got a sixtieth birthday to celebrate on Saturday. How about that? I made it that far. Happy birthday. Thank Happy you. Birthday. For a few moments there along the way I wondered if I get here, but here I am. And um, and we'll do it all again next Friday here at RCR, okay? Awesome. I'll be here. Have a great week. RCR with Paul Brennan. Reality Check Radio.